Hello, and welcome today's, to today's public briefing on the new National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's report, New Directions for Chemical Engineering. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Anderson, who is the president of the National Academy of Engineering. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the, uh, the committee and the, the staff for just an outstanding job. I've really enjoyed going through the report and I participated in the first meeting. It's a great committee and the result is expected from such, a, such an outstanding group, especially uh, in awe of what was accomplished because of COVID-19. And uh, I understand the first meeting was the only in-person meeting and to have such a report in these uh, difficult conditions is, is just really admirable. So thank you very much. There were two previous uh, reports on the future of chemical engineering that I'm aware of. In 1988, the Amundsen Report was published, The Chemical Engineering Frontiers. And then in 2003, a report entitled Beyond the Molecular Frontiers is published by, uh, led, uh, by a committee led by Matt Terrell and Ronald Breslow. Uh, the Amundsen Report focused just on chemical engineering mainly, and, uh, uh, and there are a lot of differences I'll get into in a, in a minute here. But what I took away from this report at a kind of a high level is the, the are the following. First scale, chemical engineers work over many different uh, scales from molecular to almost geological uh, scales. Secondly, this, this report emphasized the collaboration with other fields, the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary nature of our work. The third is the we must be aware of unintended consequences of our work and learn from history. It's a nice section there on <clears throat> things that appeared to be windfalls for society that ended up having negative consequences. And in the future, we've got to try our best to identify those. And finally, um, workforce. Uh, we have to prepare the workforce of the future, especially with respect to inclusiveness and making sure that the entirety of our society is engaged uh, for two reasons. One is the talent that we need to get will come from all aspects of our society, uh, all elements. And, and, and secondly, the, in, the diverse input is needed to get to the right point, to, to uh, go in the right direction. So I'm really pleased to see these emphasized. Now, when I compared this report with the Amundsen report, I, I saw some striking differences. First, in the committee itself, the Amundsen report committee had 32 members. Only one of them was a woman, and there was no racial diversity at all. This report has 18 women, uh, seven women out of 18 members of uh, this committee, and uh, it also uh, has a great deal of, of uh, ethnic and racial diversity. So that's a real plus for this report. Um, the workforce in chemical engineering wasn't emphasized as much in the uh, in the Amundsen report. Systems thinking was emphasized here much more than in the uh, Anders in the Amundsen report, especially with respect to food, water, energy nexus, uh, sustainability, and end of life concerns are, are present in this report, but somewhat absent in the other. In fact, there are three areas that do that hardly appear or don't appear at all in the Amundsen report that are highlighted in, in this report. One is on climate, climate change. Climate is mentioned once in the Amundsen report. The second is sustainability. It's not mentioned at all, I think, in the Amundsen report. And the third is pandemic. And again, not mentioned at all in the Amundsen report, but a focal point here. So that's, that's a, a real difference. And it shows uh, that, of course, things have changed in the 40, 30 plus years since the two reports. The funding of this report is also very interesting with so many different parts, over 40 sources of funding, which means there's a lot of skin in the game by a lot of people and of course should be of, of interest to a large group of stakeholders. And so I found that to be kind of crowdsourcing funding it was a kind of a unique aspect that we don't see very much at the National Academies. I want to congratulate Maggie Walzer and her staff and the, all the committee members are doing an exceptional job the path is clearly uh, forward, is clearly laid out for us. Now we must execute it. It's now my pleasure to introduce Eric Kaler, the chair of the committee. And uh, Eric, uh, we, most of us know Eric, 
but uh, he has served in many uh, leadership roles in academia, from dean, provost, president of the University of Minnesota, and now president of Case Western Reserve University. Really want to thank Eric for taking this leadership uh, and uh, you know, such a fine job of working with very talented people to get a great result. So Eric, I, I turn the microphone over to you. Great, John, thank you. And I uh, appreciate all of you in attendance. And uh, my goal here is to walk through the report at uh, obviously a pretty high level. Uh, I'm joined by about 10 of the committee members and we'll have time at the end uh, for some questions that, uh, that you may have. So uh, the motivation for the study uh, really was, uh, found its origin, I think, uh, in a 2016 uh, report from a roundtable that was held at the AICHG meeting uh, that year, and it really was that the uh, uh, the field needed a new vision uh, for the 21st century, uh, a need in some sense for a new Amundsen report. Uh, as John mentioned, I think that report was published in, in 1988. Uh, this is 2022, so currently we're exhibiting a once every 34 year pace of a comprehensive report like this, our field can probably do better than uh, than three a century, and it was overdue, uh, I think, for us to come together and and look at the problems and challenges that we uh, we have in front of it. Uh, again, uh, as John mentioned, the community provided uh, support for the study. Uh, not quite crowdsourcing, but the next slide will show uh, contributions from uh, 45. Uh, academic departments, um, two professional societies, four federal, uh, 12 private sector groups. It really does, uh, I think, speak uh, to the health of our, of our community, the health of our profession, that so many uh, people would come forward with, uh, with resources to, to execute uh, on what they perceive to be an important uh, mission. So the committee uh, was made up uh, initially of uh, 18 members. Uh, Cheryl Teich uh, stepped off in September of 2022, leaving 17. Um, six of them uh, have a deep experience in industry, although only two are currently uh, in industry and one at a national lab. But um, uh, uh, Monty, uh, Demetrius, uh, Enrique, uh, Sang, Tunde and Jose, uh, obviously, uh, and Cheryl, uh, deep, uh, long careers in industrial uh, research. So we felt the committee was fairly balanced with respect to academic uh, and uh, in industry uh, and balanced in other dimensions, as John mentioned. Uh, we also thought that we had reasonable coverage uh, of the field. Uh, with, with 17 people, it's not possible to blanket a field as diverse as chemical engineering, uh, but I think we did a pretty good job. And where we had gaps or, or areas of knowledge uh, missing, uh, we reached out to experts in a variety of, of areas, and particularly uh, in respect to electronic materials, uh, we had a formal set of consultants from uh, EMD Electronics that provided us with uh, some terrific uh, insight into uh, that field. Um, the report has so far been downloaded uh, about 1,700 uh, times, and uh, we feel it will have uh, an impact. And of course, none of this work uh, could have been done without the really spectacular uh, help and guidance of Maggie Walzer and her staff uh, of the National Academies, uh, holding us to task, keeping us on time, uh, and focused uh, extraordinarily a strong effort uh, by, by that team. So uh, we have a statement of task, which of course we have to have to get to work. And it uh, really starts, oh dear, I'm sorry, I forgot a, a very sad thing. Uh, shortly after the report uh, issued, uh, our dear friend Tundi uh, Oganaki passed away. <clears throat> he was an enormously important contributor uh, to this report and a friend and mentor uh, to many of us. And uh, we have uh, arranged to dedicate this report to him. Thank you. <clears throat> so our statement of task uh, was to describe, uh, as you might expect, what are the advance advances in chemical engineering? What's changed? Uh, where do we put this field in perspective with respect to society? Uh, obviously, there's been enormous technical process in many areas, uh, particularly around uh, big data, artificial intelligence, uh, sensors, uh, et cetera. Uh, 
the practice of R&D has changed. Uh, large industrially sponsored uh, research organizations are now quite rare in chemical engineering, and uh, we have evolved into different ways of getting research done. And we really wanted to spend a substantial amount of effort talking about the society factors that have, that have impacted the field, and in particular, uh, questions around who gets to be a chemical engineer. So our task was uh, the easy one of predicting the future. Uh, we were asked to look over a 10 to 30 year uh, time horizon uh, and really identify challenges and opportunities, uh, identify existing areas and new areas that are likely to be promising ones for both intellectual growth and research investments, uh, and identify areas where science was, was missing. Uh, we again focused on undergraduate and graduate chemical engineering uh, education and talk about in that section of the report uh, some both modest and significant changes to how that part of our business gets done. And finally, and last but not least, we were charged with uh, putting some perspective around where United States chemical engineering sits in respect uh, to that around the world. So that was our task, and to tackle it, uh, we identified uh, the following uh, approaches. Uh, we first talked about the, the major societal and environmental areas in which uh, we could work, and you see them uh, listed there, energy, food and water, health and medicine, manufacturing materials and tools. Um, I think most anybody listening on this call uh, would generate a, a list of six topics that, that in some sense overlaps considerably. Uh, with these. Of course, we were uh, also informed by conversations around the grand challenges uh, identified by, by the National Academy of Engineering and, uh, organ uh, and other organizations. So again, you'll see that play out in the structure uh, of, uh, of the report. Uh, but the initial uh, gathering of information and writing was organized uh, around those topics in addition to, to chemical engineering education. So uh, again, uh, challenges and opportunities, new areas, uh, really uh, talked about the, the key challenges, uh, both the positive ones of, of opportunities, uh, as well as the need to address uh, particularly some of the environmental uh, impacts of chemical engineering choices and activities uh, of the past. And so again, the topics of energy, the energy transition, food, water, and air, that nexus health and medicine, manufacturing and circular economy, sustainability and, and environmental impact, uh, and uh, the role chemical engineers play in materials uh, synthesis and manufacturing. Now, uh, as John mentioned, this report was done during COVID, which really presented some interesting uh, challenges, but also uh, opportunities. We had one in-person meeting to kick us off in February of, of 2020, and then it was virtual. Uh, the good news about that is that we had an opportunity uh, to meet more times uh, than we would have had uh, were we to meet uh, in person, uh, shorter meetings, but, but more of them. Uh, that's probably an efficient way uh, to, to do some uh, of that work. We also were able to reach out to over 60 uh, guests um, uh, from a variety of, of backgrounds and, and experiences. Uh, and again, that's far more many people than we would have uh, uh, been able to, uh, to talk to uh, in person. Uh, 27 of the meetings were had, had at least a part open uh, to the public, and uh, we took input there as, as we got it. Uh, we also had a town hall style session uh, at the 2019 Orlando uh, meeting of the AISHE, uh, and we uh, participated in two uh, virtual session, uh, AICHE virtual local section uh, meetings to get, uh, to get input, uh, and we distributed a questionnaire broadly. So uh, those are the elements of the, 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 the input uh, that we took from, from our community and began then to, to synthesize uh, into the, the following areas, which uh, really uh, identify uh, as the chapters uh, at the core uh, of the report. And of course, um, no chemical engineering report, I think, could, could, could not lead with uh, the greatest challenge facing uh, our, our planet, which is uh, global warming uh, and the necessity for decarbonization of, the, of energy systems to, uh, 
do a deal uh, with that. And, and that's right in the wheelhouse of chemical engineers, obviously. Uh, equally important, perhaps, from the longer term, is sustainable uh, engineering uh, solutions, environmental uh, awareness. Um, then uh, flexible manufacturing, the circular economy, obviously playing uh, directly into that. Uh, targeted and accessible medicine. Uh, we talk um, a great deal, well, the public talks a great deal about the breakthrough of of science and medicine in the creation of the COVID vaccine and the delivery. Uh, what sometimes gets missed is that absolutely central to the COVID-19 vaccine response was engineering, and in, in particular, chemical engineering, from understanding lipid nanoparticles uh, to understanding how to make massive numbers of doses and distribute them around the world uh, in an environment that is cold chain limited. Uh, is an engineering problem, and it was solved by engineers. Uh, we spent some time uh, thinking about how chemical engineers play the role in, in materials uh, science and engineering broadly. Uh, what can we do, uh, do in that space? Uh, then we talked about tools, and of course, the tool uh, that is likely to have the largest impact on, on perhaps engineering in general, but chemical engineering in particular, uh, is machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, ma managing large uh, data sets. And we spent some good amount of time talking about what that future might look like. Clearly, uh, we have to, to grow uh, the next generation of chemical engineers. Uh, that generation cannot look like the generation that was before us. Uh, we need to reach out more broadly. Uh, to people from, from all backgrounds and welcome them uh, into uh, the engine of chemical engineering. And finally, uh, the final chapter is on international uh, leadership. Uh, and the next uh, group of slides, uh, I will take you through these again at, at a high level. Uh, I will refer you to the report uh, for, for details or perhaps uh, to questions at the end. Uh, the diagram on, uh, on the right part of the slide is, of course, the call to action uh, for, uh, for our society. This is the increase in atmospheric CO2 uh, over the past uh, 270 years, uh, and uh, it doesn't, I think, need amplification for this uh, audience. Uh, addressing climate change will require a lot of things, but decarbonization of current energy systems uh, is one where uh, chemical engineers play a role. Uh, we really must take a lead in uh, the transition from the current energy landscape to one that's based on renewable and sustainable energy sources, uh, while at the same time trying to reduce the carbon footprint uh, of, of fossil fuels. So that's expanded. Uh, a little bit on the next slide, please. Uh, here we talked about uh, decarbonization in terms of sources, carriers, methods of storage, uh, use, uh, and ultimately then put the potential for carbon capture uh, and use and storage of that, uh, of that carbon. Uh, and the, the bullets here are, are merely illustrative. Um, the report goes into to greater uh, detail, but uh, again, solar technology, shale oil and gas, uh, biofuels production, uh, investigation of alternatives, uh, in particular uh, bio-based ones such as lignin. Uh, Reimagining uh, petroleum uh, refineries, uh, what's the role of clean hydrogen and, and the, the role of the different ways to produce hydrogen uh, in, in fish, <coughs> efficiencies of chemical transformation, uh, catalysis, <coughs> breakthroughs uh, at hand there. Chemical engineers play a role uh, in, in battery uh, technology and design, uh, particularly for end-of-life disposal. Uh, clearly, uh, the geopolitical issues around you know, relying on batteries that are uh, made from materials that are mined uh, in countries with, uh, with the potential for hostility with the United States is not a particularly good long-term idea. So how do we design batteries that use uh, earth-abundant uh, elements? Uh, the electric vehicle revolution is, is uh, certainly here, large automobile manufacturers identifying a date beyond which they will not make gasoline powered cars. Uh, and of course, some attention needs to be played to reducing emissions from very large materials and chemical production. Uh, cement in production in particular, as you probably know, is a huge uh, producer of, of greenhouse gas. Uh, and then uh, carbon uh, capture. 
uh, and use uh, it will be uh, again an area of engagement by chemical engineers. Uh, we then uh, followed with some recommendations uh, for uh, this this section, and you'll see sort of this modality in in the rest of the sections as I as I walk through them. Uh, the ideas, the topic, the little illustration, and then the recommendations. And so here, the recommendations are our federal research advancements uh, investments uh, in uh, lower zero carbon energy, photochemistry. Uh, water uh, conservation as a resource should be a theme, uh, carbon capture used in storage. And again, on many of the slides that, that follow, uh, you will see a, a focus on interdisciplinary cross-sector uh, collaborations as we try to bring not only the, the science and engineering in, into existence in the laboratory, uh, but also uh, grow it to pilot and ultimately demonstration stage, scale projects in, in many areas. And again, uh, I hope what comes out in this report is the dramatic focus on, uh, on the boundaries of our discipline, the need for interdisciplinary work, cross-sector work. Uh, not everybody knows all that we need to do to advance on these, so we're going to need uh, teams of, of people collaborating. You'll see that in many places. Next was the uh, environmental system um, uh, challenge, the, the, the untangling of the, the so-called food uh, energy, food, water, energy nexus, the, the uh, interconnections uh, of the management of those uh, three resources. And of course, uh, the energy conversation we just had is tightly uh, wound uh, into this. The next slide suggests some sustainable engineering solutions for environmental systems. Uh, and again, these are begin in our report to get a, a little bit granular. Uh, frankly, where where we think are, are really is some some low hanging fruit uh, to be done, uh, advanced separations and in, in treatment technologies for uh, for water, you know, on the fundamental um, issues of understanding the structure of water, uh, hydration of ions and in charged surfaces. Uh, we feel uh, fundamental science advances there, which would uh, be done uh, in the United States largely by people in chemical engineering departments and academics. Uh, would have great benefit. Uh, we think there are good chemical engineering problems related to the management of, uh, of food, uh, improving yield. Um, the Haber-Bosch uh, uh, ammonia production, of course, uh, in a real sense, uh, generated the Green Revolution and, and, and is responsible for millions of people being alive. Uh, it is also incredibly energy intensive and, and has a, a big environmental footprint. How, what else can we do? Um, in air, uh, pollution emission, of course, but uh, also uh, continuing work pioneered by chemical engineers and understanding the fundamental properties of, of aerosols. And again, we make uh, investment uh, recommendations. Uh, again, as I mentioned, structure and dynamics of water, separation technologies. And again, here we can be a little more specific about the kind of interdisciplinary cross-sector uh, collaborations, whether it's in metabolic engineering, a process, a bioprocess development, uh, the others that you read here uh, really provide uh, fertile ground, uh, no pun intended, uh, for chemical engineers to, to interact with, with bioscientists uh, and others around uh, these opportunities. Uh, next, we turned our attention to, um, to engineering targeted and accessible <coughs> medicine. Uh, this is an example of, of actually a, a paper by Tundi. Um, around process modeling uh, for complex uh, biological systems. And we really, in this section, organize things around personalized medicine, uh, which this would be an, an example, improving therapeutics, understanding the microbiome, uh, the, the opportunities for materials, devices, and delivery. delivery, uh, And even for something that seems so prosaic as hygiene, but for example, uh, they are understanding the, uh, the time scale for airborne, airborne suspension of, of uh, aerosols uh, would be helpful. Maggie is running the slides very quickly for me. Uh, we then talked about uh, um, first improving therapeutics. And there we thought, for example, a predictive approach to vaccine uh, subunit selection using data mining and machine learning could provide some breakthroughs. Uh, for vaccines uh, far, uh, there's their discovery far more rapidly than we do now. Next, engineering targeted and accessible 
medicine, uh, in particular the idea of computational approaches uh, to enable uh, predictive uh, capabilities or predicting capabilities of specific uh, signaling pathways uh, would, be, would be an option. So the next slide, please, Mangi, and then the one after that we're ready for. Uh, materials, devices, and deliveries, the opportunity uh, in particular to create and understand non-invasive methods or very minimally invasive methods uh, for drug delivery. Uh, again, uh, chemical engineers work in this area, opportunities available to expand. And the next slide is again, um, federal research investment. Uh, in that area of biomolecular engineering, personalized medicine, uh, devices, uh, systems, and synthetic biology, uh, a, a field in which chemical engineers uh, immediately can feel at home and make contributions. And of course, a constant focus on cost and health equity. Uh, again, here, the, the, the theme you're beginning to see reappear again and again, interdisciplinary cross-sector collaborations uh, to drive uh, pilot and demonstration scale, scale uh, processes. Next was a flexible, the idea of flexible manufacturing in the circular uh, economy, uh, the idea uh, that we take feedstock sources, whether they be biomass, municipal, uh, or oils from, from uh, plants or fats, uh, treat those to create uh, the feedstocks that you see there, uh, and then using biological or chemical transformation, uh, produce uh, materials, uh, either intermediates or final uh, products for, for application. So being able to produce that spectrum of final or intermediate products from a range of uh, sources in a flexible way, uh, we feel offers real opportunities, particularly as we evolve from a petroleum-based uh, economy. Uh, process intensification, the next slide, please, um, emerged as an opportunity in several uh, areas. This particular example is uh, reactive distillation uh, and an example uh, in the electronics uh, industry uh, as a way to, uh, to reduce uh, waste materials, uh, improve efficiency, uh, allow uh, some just-in-time manufacturing and a variety of other uh, flexible um, uh, work streams. And the circular economy, uh, again, we focused on ways that chemical engineers would, uh, would want to uh, re redesign uh, processes so as uh, to reduce uh, waste streams, uh, improve uh, opportunities for, for upcycling, and, uh, and, and again, um, allowing uh, our industry, our society to have a smaller environmental footprint. But we then again uh, talk about research investment and, and we give some pretty specific examples, I think, based by, by a good set of facts on areas that, that we felt would be, uh, would be important uh, process intensification, uh, for example, as well as the others uh, that you can read. And again, here are the interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, both on, on scaled down and scaled out processes. So again, smaller scale processes generating very minimal uh, waste uh, an area of, of further investigation. So next we turned our attention to, uh, to materials for the 21st century. And uh, this is an area uh, in which um, a group, not this group, a different group uh, could write an entire report in and of itself. And in fact, those, there are some recent ones that, uh, that exist. So, so here we felt that appropriate for uh, us to visit, not comprehensively, but in areas where we thought uh, the chemical engineers knowledge of, of process and molecules and products um, would, would be of most use, sort of the, the, the uh, uh, processing synthesis point of view. And in that we talked about really five uh, specific areas, polymer science and engineering, uh, complex fluids and soft materials, nanoparticles, biomaterials, and electronic materials. And so, um, and for example, the polymer uh, synthesis, the polymer uh, area, we could think about uh, moving from from simple sequences that we 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 can make in a laboratory uh, to increasing complexity, while at the same time learning uh, from highly complex molecules like proteins. Uh, and back engineering how they fold and generate the properties that make them useful and begin to, to merge 
uh, in the middle uh, with computation in, in large data sets and begin to be able to predict uh, from fundamental sequencing what the uh, final material property uh, would be. Uh, the other example I'll give is biomaterials, which uh, again uh, is an example here in the in the illustration uh, of the ability of using uh, bio um, matrices and uh, and gels to repair tissues and organs, or at the same time provide for drug delivery, wound repair, uh, and tissue regeneration, perhaps all in one kind of, of process. Uh, and again, uh, the federal and industry but research investment in uh, these areas, uh, we think were pretty uh, well justified. Finally, uh, the tools chapter, the next slide uh, is the, the last of the, the hardware, if you will. Um, this is, I, I think, a very revealing uh, slide. Uh, this is a count of AICHE meeting abstracts with various terms <coughs> related to data science. So. Uh, we thought the, the appearance of various terms in AICHE abstracts would give us a re reasonably good measure of what chemical engineers were interested in. Uh, and if you look here, uh, broken out are machine learning, neural network, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and data science. And you see in, uh, until about 2015 uh, or so, uh, relatively modest, there, there may be mentioned 50 times. Um, and now, by the time you get to 2020, a mere five years later, uh, all of those terms are mentioned nearly 400 times. So eight times as much interest in these fields uh, measured by this metric, which you may or may not like, uh, is, um, is pretty, and pretty indicative uh, of what we're seeing across the field, that, that these areas of artificial intelligence and, and its uh, fellow travelers are certainly uh, growing uh, in importance. Uh, and again, part of that will be improving modeling and simulation and lifecycle uh, assessment capabilities using these tools, uh, as well as feeding these large data sets with novel instrumentation and, and sensors, which are coming more ubiquitous and available at lower and lower cost. So then we turned our attention uh, next to training and fostering the next uh, generation of, of chemical engineers. And uh, we as a field, uh, must uh, become more diverse and more welcoming uh, to people from diverse backgrounds. And this is a little data that shows you uh, over a 10 year period, uh, the percentage of degrees uh, awarded uh, to women uh, in engineering overall, which is the lower uh, green bar, uh, to biomedical engineering, uh, which is the tallest uh, red orangey bar, that's the largest in the engineering fields. Uh, in chemical engineering uh, in the blue bar. And you see um, really two takeaways from this. One is that uh, the percentage of, of degrees given to women in chemical engineering is larger than that for engineering overall, uh, but it stayed stubbornly uh, at around 33%, uh, all degrees, bachelor's, master's, and, and PhD uh, for a long time. So to the degree that we think we're moving the dial on increasing gender diversity in chemical engineering, we're not. The next slide shows uh, data uh, also for the percentage of chemical engineering award degrees awarded to black, indigenous, and people of color uh, BIPOC population. And again, from 2008 to 2018, the percent of bachelors awarded, uh, masters awarded, absolutely flat lines, no change in improvement of diversity over 10 years uh, in our field. Uh, and the percentage of um, PhDs uh, you see fluctuates and partly uh, that's the sad, sad fact of you're dealing with this, with the statistic of small, small numbers. Uh, and so a, a difference of one or two individuals actually moves that line. Um, again, uh, I don't know that you need uh, any more evidence than that about the urgent need for our field uh, to be more uh, diverse and welcoming. Um, so the next slide uh, begins to inter interface or identify uh, rather some of the ideas that could, could help us uh, in this space. Uh, they break into curriculum revisions in general and then ways to attract more women and uh, black indigenous people of color to our fields. Uh, the curriculum revisions uh, again, um, 
you know, we talked about these, we recognize the tyranny of 120 credits, the, the idea that if we take something, put something in, we have to take something out, we, we got that. Uh, but some of the key ideas that emerged were uh, working uh, from a pedagogical point of view to make more connections across the core disciplines uh, more quickly. And so to not teach uh, fluid mechanics or kinetics uh, in a silo, uh, but rather to try to make connections uh, between them and to do that as soon in the curriculum as we could because of the, the, the need to, to catch the interest and, and attract and retain uh, students. Uh, pretty much everyone we talk to uh, as, a, as a visitor to our committee uh, sooner or later got around to the fact that experiential learning uh, was an important thing that we should do uh, better, uh, whether that's internships or other uh, methods um, uh, can be determined, but we need more uh, hands-on experience uh, both in, in the academic influence and out of it. Uh, we also thought that the opportunity to create a little space uh, could be uh, bringing math uh, and statistics uh, out of the math department and into the core uh, and teaching, uh, teaching what our students need uh, to know, but perhaps uh, not much more than that in the core. In terms of attracting uh, other students, uh, we really think our field needs to talk very much more about the opportunities chemical engineers have to impact uh, society, uh, the difference that we can make in, in human lives. Uh, we need more effective mentoring and supporting uh, structures uh, for all students, but in particular uh, students who are not in the majority. Um, we also felt that we, as a field, uh, leave closed what could be an important pipeline to our field uh, by the fact that most of our curricula are, are restricted to, the, to at least the final two years, uh, if not many with, with key courses taught in the sophomore year and some. Uh, with courses taught in the freshman year, uh, the latter two of those really eliminate, eliminate the ability to attract transfer students who would earn a two-year degree uh, somewhere and then transfer uh, to, uh, to our uh, program, uh, to chemical engineering. And uh, we have some ways uh, to, uh, to, to enable that effectively, uh, we think, and they're explored in the, uh, uh, in the report. Uh, turning next to graduate students, uh, again, um, we, we really um, thought carefully uh, about moving uh, away from the, the sort of siloed mentor-mentee, I'm a graduate student working on my project thesis, to something that's broader uh, and allows some internships, uh, allows uh, coordination uh, among university industry and, and funding agencies from the AICHE to create a an experience that was, uh, was more similar to what they might find in an industrial uh, environment and might actually prepare them better more broadly uh, for a research career if that's uh, where they want to go. Uh, again, to attract uh, more uh, people uh, of different experiences, uh, we really uh, think it's, it's important to think about how we revise uh, admissions criteria uh, to remove artificial barriers that, that we put in place to, to uh, really narrow uh, the, the lens through which we look. Uh, and, a, and an additional way is to be more purposeful about welcoming students who have undergraduate degrees in disciplines that are not uh, chemical engineering disciplines that have larger fractions of women or uh, students of color that I think uh, could quite easily uh, prosper in chemical engineering. So in terms of recommendations here, uh, we thought that uh, universities and AICHE as a convener uh, could build and share curated chemical engineering content that would be accepted by all chemical engineering departments. And if we did that for the entry level courses that are taught sometimes in the sophomore year, those could be taken uh, remotely by students at two-year colleges uh, and uh, enable them to enter the curriculum uh, on time. Uh, and then uh, we do think this is worthy of, of substantial more conversation. Uh, so we are, are in, in favor of convening a summit uh, focused on uh, technology enabled learning uh, innovations like I'm talking about here uh, in ways to really try to look around the corner uh, about what the future of chemical engineering education uh, and chemical engineering uh, people would be. So our final topic was international uh, leadership, and I'll be very brief uh, here. Um, 
it's very clear um, by, 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 by the data and, and the data in this plot shows um, the number of publications uh, in chemical engineering uh, and bend into five-year increments from 1981. <coughs> and the, the blue bar uh, that is dominant in uh, the first five uh, sectors uh, are contributions from the United States. Uh, the bar that is now dominant in the past five, immediately past five years by a lot, uh, is Asia, and that's largely driven uh, by outputs from China. And it's a direct consequence of large investments in R&D uh, that the Chinese uh, uh, government has made. Um, the, the advantage of, of this in some real sense is that if you want to know what the the Chinese plan is, uh, they simply tell you uh, what their plan is in science and engineering. And, and it's clearly having a, a very big impact on um, their work in fields that are, that are called chemical engineering. Uh, so again, we think the, the approach there is to make research investments uh, across the board in chemical engineering as discussed in our report uh, to support international collaborations uh, to support U.S. researchers connecting uh, to points of strength in other countries. Uh, we felt, I think it's fair to say, that most of those international collaborations uh, are grassroots uh, originated. They're faculty to faculty interactions and supporting that growth and the, the movement of, of students and the collaboration uh, would be uh, the best way uh, to enable our future success on the international playing field. I know, uh, as I say that, um, we're witnessing a war in Central Europe, so I don't mean to be naive about the geopolitics of this, but uh, the data here speaks to itself. Uh, so that's the last of my prepared talks. I appreciate all of you uh, attending. Uh, I'd be delighted now to open it to some, uh, some questions. Uh, I think there's a QA and a uh, icon at the bottom of your Zoom on the far right, and if you type your your questions into there. I will uh, uh, see those. I think yes, and uh, then I will I will summarize uh, the question and then uh, ask um, individuals to uh, to respond. Um, so the first question from Taesok Moon: uh, Interdisciplinary field different than when it began. Yeah, good perspective on this point. Uh, you know, I really think, um, you know, we'll touch on it throughout here. It's woven throughout our report, uh, the need for uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, approaches to, um, to all of our, our problems. Uh, does the report provide guidance from a broader systems approach regarding the energy, water, carbon nexus, appropriate applications? Uh, geological carbon sequestration requires large pipeline systems. Um, yeah, and so there is some, um, some discussion in the report about a variety of, of carbon sequestration uh, challenges. And again, um, you know, part of our, our charge was to actually not do uh, original uh, research. So we cited both opportunities and, um, uh, and challenges there. Uh, and I think the reader can can build on those to uh, to going to go forward there. Uh, anyone else on the committee want to address that um, that question while we're here? I, Rachel, you took the lead on some of the energy, food, water questions. If you want to add or amplify, um, only to say that there is a chapter on food, energy, water nexus with exactly the understanding that's that's being asked for in the question that. Frequently, one solution to one, one portion of the triangle comes with significant costs to the others. And the chemical engineering systems approach, in combination with uh, civil engineering and other systems level approaches, is very necessary to untangle all of this. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, then the question from Adam Jones, um, do you see other funders active in the space, such as philanthropy or venture capitalism? Um, do have recommendations to identify foster connections between basic research policy uh, and, and market forces. Um, I think venture capital uh, will certainly uh, play a role. Um, it, it does already. There's an innumerable number of, 
of uh, startup uh, companies that have emerged primarily from, from university research in chemical engineering um, already. Uh, we talked to, uh, to a couple at least of, of people uh, at that early stage. So I, I think you'll see venture play a role there. Um, you know, it is, it, you know, it's a different kettle of fish than making an app, right? Because you generally need uh, some built infrastructure, you need laboratory equipment, et cetera. So, so the entry point there for, for venture or angel investment is, is different than it is in the software uh, industry, but it, it is there and I think it'll grow. Uh, and I think all of us uh, in the academic world rely on private philanthropy uh, to some degree to support uh, research activities and, and that's there. Um, you know, do I see a big play? Um, I mean, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation has put a call out for a $200 million uh, great big idea to, uh, to solve. Uh, and I think you could easily find uh, problems and solutions at center in chemical engineering uh, that would be competitive for those kinds of, of things. So uh, I, um, I see that. Anybody else? I don't want to hog the question uh, answering. So if anyone on the committee would like to, to jump in, please just do. Eric, this is Ann Robinson. I was also going to mention the, the Manufacturing USA uh, groups have been helping to bridge that divide. It's, it's kind of half industry funded, half federal funded. And uh, I can't remember the, the name of the one that's associated with AICHE. I apologize, but I do re remember the biotechnology one, which is nimble. Uh, there's also you know, a, a number of other ones, but the, those I think are, are helping with those partnerships. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. Uh, Nimble and USA Manufacturing are programs that, that are USA Manufacturing to program uh, supported at NIST and Nimble is a, is a very large uh, center for them. And uh, it's at the University of Delaware and led by a chemical engineer. So they're, they're, <laughs> we can be everywhere in that, uh, in that space. Um, just saying here, um, yeah, and thank you for volunteering. Would you want to talk about the, the challenges of diversifying, why, why we failed? And uh, yeah, how about it, please? Sure. Uh, <laughs> it's a topic that's, that's certainly of great interest uh, to many of us now and, and, and uh, for a while. I think, I think there's two things that, that people have identified. And, and one is engineering as a, as a whole, not just chemical engineering, needs to do a better job marketing ourselves as uh, problem solvers for the world. There's, there's a lot of data, some is anecdotal, but some is, is surveys, which entering, entering freshmen don't always get exposed to engineering. And, and when they do, they, they see the, the accidents, and that's particularly true for for women and uh, and students of color. Is that they don't don't see us as problem solvers. So that's something that that we as a whole need to work on. The other problem is is uh, really addressing some of the the socioeconomic challenges, where again that pairing and and getting. Uh, a connection to community colleges, I think, will help with a transition uh, that that's highlighted in the the report, and I think that will continue to be a, a potential future avenue. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to address that? This is Rachel. Can I uh, leap in? I'm going to wear uh, Gilda Barbarino's hat just for a second because she's not here anymore. The way she framed a lot of this was thinking about who gets to be a chemical engineer. Mm -hmm. And we have one challenge with that um, very much so because there's not a high school class called chemical engineering. And so even just people choosing a major is already a huge filter. And so this is a big part of the marketing and also our thinking about connections, community colleges, marketing ourselves within our own campuses, um, which is not something that we've thought about in the past, but it's an important part of diversifying our discipline. Great, thank you. 
question of the topic whether diversity is a matter of attraction or retention or both, but uh, uh, clearly both. Um, bringing math and statistics, motivation for this that our Kimmy students are not getting good enough instruction or they're getting too much irrelevant, unnecessary math. Um, I think it's it's a little bit of both. I, I think again, you know, we're asking a hard question, which is how do you create more space in the undergraduate chemical engineering curriculum? Um, and, you know, a answer is to uh, streamline and improve um, the utility of the math education that that our students get. There's the other side of the, of the coin, which says math should be taught by mathematicians, chemistry by chemists. People who are subject matter <clears throat> experts should uh, should teach the uh, the subject. That's, I think, a pretty valid point of view as all. Well. I suspect it's probably going to be a local um, solution. Uh, you know, I, I tend a little bit to, to appreciate experts teaching experts. You don't necessarily want the, the ag school to teach the history of the horse, but um, it may be in some places that that, that is a real opportunity in, in, in math. Uh, significant part of a presentation systems, AI, et cetera, uh, the bottom line is, um, yet we don't see uh, growth of those areas in, um, uh, in research groups. And the short answer to that is follow the money. So if uh, the recommendations that we've made uh, are followed up by funding agencies and there's increased research uh, support available, uh, I think you'll see people uh, evolve their research areas into, into uh, investigation of those uh, kinds of problems, again, bringing in perhaps people uh, trained in those disciplines and other fields and applying their knowledge to uh, to chemical engineering. I think it's, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask Sharon uh, Lotzer if she's still here to weigh in on that, but I think she'll tell you that a it's much uh, better to take a chemical engineering, train them in something about uh, data science than it is take a data scientist and teach her chemical engineering. But Sharon, I don't, I can't see you on this tiny screen. If you want to amplify that or not, <laughs> don't mean to put yes, you in Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was looking for the, the mute button, um, un the unmute button. Um, yes, indeed. I mean, we, we uh, it's, you know, data science, AI, machine learning is swept over everything. Um, and it's sweeping through chemical engineering, and um, and you know students are are you know voting with their feet to learn uh, you know all of these new ideas in in, uh, in, in AI and data science, um, and there are just extraordinary opportunities to be had in all of the engineering and science disciplines from applying these new new techniques. Um, but our current curriculum really doesn't doesn't reflect that, um, and we hear from so many employers that in, in chem, you know uh, chemical companies and, and other companies that regularly employ chemical engineers that it's very hard for them to hire data scientists who want to do chemical engineering research. They just want to do data science research, and it really doesn't matter so much what what it's on. But they don't bring that necessary. Uh, disciplinary knowledge that a chemical engineer would have. And so uh, in the, the report touches on how we need to find a way to integrate these topics into um, chemical engineering curricula, uh, both at the graduate and um, undergraduate level. Great. Anyone else from the committee on this topic? Just, I'll just follow up. It's yeah. tremendous energy and uh, faculty search committees are all focusing on this. There's a real um, groundswell uh, and every major grant that's attacking a problem from multiple viewpoints is including these kinds of um, approaches. So I really think that it's going to be a self-healing issue that the person's brought up. Yeah, maybe another comment, uh, Eric, and that is that uh, at least at the graduate level, we're training increasing numbers of chemical engineers that uh, are well versed in machine learning, data science. But we lose them. We lose them to other industries uh, that are uh, you know, paying large sums of money and uh, and 
frankly presenting some very interesting problems. So uh, uh, we need to do something to keep them in engineering. We want that uh, to grow in strength, particularly in industry. Great. Um, one question is to paraphrase, um, the breadth is fine, but some complex problems need depth. And so, um, you know, the idea, at least at the graduate level, that you would have a, a T-shaped curriculum where you would go pretty broad and understand some of the issues in different disciplines, but then you go deep, the, the stock of the T in the area of particular expertise that you want to develop. So you need, um, you, you certainly do need um, true experts in particular uh, in particular fields, but um, it, they, I think, and I think it's fair to say the committee thinks they will be working uh, in inter interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary teams more and more often to work on the real problems that are in front of us. Um, Alexander, Alex, ah, good. Um, uh, breaking down barriers between chemical engineering and, and adjacent fields. Uh, from a funding perspective, there's still some delineations. Um, I think that's true. I think they're going to go away. I think they are going away, and I think they will uh, continue to go away. And again, that's sort of the drumbeat theme of this report is, is the, the need for interdisciplinarity. Uh, Tom Deegan, a lot of names I know here. Uh, is there any uh, granularity around the topics that the Chinese chemical engineering research publications are highlighting, or are they similar uh, to US ones? Um, that's a great question, and I'm embarrassed that I don't think I know the answer to, to that. I don't think we looked with enough detail to, to actually see, unless someone on the committee wants to throw me a lifeline here. Okay. Um, it's a great question. I think the answer is we didn't look at that. Right, we did not look at but that. But it would be a very interesting thing to look at. I suspect that the topics will be very similar. Uh, yeah, I suspect too, but it would be, that's a good question. We, we don't know. Uh, some, part, some parts of the curriculum uh, must be omitted. Uh, can you uh, indication what that might be? Um, beyond the math uh, simplification, uh, I think it's fair to say that we summarize that what we may see uh, is some departments beginning to look more, um, uh, not necessarily narrow, well, narrower, uh, and not uh, teach everything uh, about everything to everybody. Uh, but again, I think that's gonna be local, uh, a local evolution rather than a, than a top-down uh, element. Uh, we also uh, see as the last recommendation in, in, uh, in the education part, uh, the idea of the summit. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time talking about and, and some of the conversation made it to the report uh, you know, the roles of, of education technology, distance learning, uh, asynchronous education, et cetera, uh, are, are going to be uh, an important part of the future. And so that probably offers opportunities for, uh, for innovation, for, for compression of curricular items uh, that, that could make space for some, uh, some more things. Um, this was a subject uh, dear to Monty's uh, heart, and I'll offer you the chance, Monty, if you want to weigh in on that topic a little bit. Yeah, building on some of your comments, Eric, uh, this has been a big subject of discussion at the AICHE. AICHE uh, just created the new Institute for Learning and Innovation, and the intent of this institute is to be a bridge between the university and the, and the workplace, and to have shared practices and content, and, and use this as a bridge for things that can be shared, not just across universities, but, but across the range. And thinking both in the area of both education, as well as research and new innovation programs. Thank you. Um, any role for technologists in the chemi area, growing chemical technology, chemical engineering technology programs, uh, community and technical colleges. 
Uh, that's not a topic that we really explored uh, very much at all. Uh, that might be an opportunity, but we did not we did not talk about that. I have one comment on that one, Eric. Sure. The, um, it's also been a subject of debate, a discussion at AICHE. The most popular course in the AICHE Academy is chemical engineering for non-chemical engineers. And so there's been a lot of discussion about how do we make chemical engineering concepts much more accessible and broad-based, including community colleges and, and you know, reach out to other disciplines as well. That's great. That would be a great venue for AICHE to explore that question. Thank you. Well, we are at five o'clock. We promised you an hour uh, presentation and I'm just running my eye down the other questions. Maggie, is there, are there ones that I missed here that we should pick up? There's one uh, that I would like you to cover um, is that uh, whether there's any concern about the faculty of the future having less industrial experience. Um, it's commonplace today for people to go from PhD to postdoc to academia. Um, you know, we didn't articulate that uh, in any uh, great detail, uh, partly because, as I pointed out at the beginning, five or six of our committee members had had substantial careers in, in industry before uh, coming to, to academics. Uh, that pipeline uh, does, uh, does still work, and I suspect it's not going to, uh, to close uh, off. Um, and even, uh, you know, individuals, I'll use my own example, even though I didn't work in a um, industrial environment. Um, I had a very um, engaged uh, consulting activity. So I saw lots of lots of very relevant engineering issues in industry and, and worked on them and brought some of those back into my research topics. Um, so we did not identify that as a strong concern. I think that's fair to say. Maybe someone else wants to weigh on that it would be fine. Well, I agree with that, Eric. I know. And another way to potentially mitigate that is for industry to sponsor more research at universities. And this also goes back to the commitment earlier. Uh, the federal agencies are dominating the funding currently compared to philanthropy and uh, VC, and that's a growth opportunity. Uh, the ability to solve problem is directly related to the amount of funding. So more the merrier. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good point. Thank you, Samir. All right. Okay, I think that's it for question times. And thank you, Eric. I will now give you a break and let you get a glass of water. <laughs> I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today. Um, and if you haven't already, I've dropped a link to download the report in the chat box. Um, so you can download that there. And thanks for joining us. <laughs>